Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this important conversation today. I'm Kristen Stanton, and on behalf of CMU's Career and Professional Development Center, I'd like to welcome you to our panel. We're really happy to have this opportunity to discuss best practices in recruitment from the unique perspective of our students and with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know how important this topic is to everyone here. And as employers, many of you have already given a lot of thought to how to engage and recruit underrepresented students. This is also a really important issue for our students. And so we're happy to provide a forum for their voices to be heard. We hope that you as employers will gain new insights into what's working well, um, maybe what could be improved on by hearing from a group of diverse students who are actively engaged in the search for a job or an internship. Also joining us on today's panel is a leader in CMU's Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion who can offer insights on how his team can help facilitate some of these conversations and connections. So before we begin, I just wanna clear up a few housekeeping items. Um, as you can tell, participant cameras and microphones are turned off. And so during the webinar, we would encourage you to put any questions you might have into the Q&A function. Um, we do have Career Center staff ready to answer questions or to source them up to our panelists after we finish asking the questions that have been submitted in advance. And then once we get through those pre-selected questions, we'll open the forum up to other questions that you might have today. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists, Adriana Martinez, Charlie Anderson, James Summers, Natalie Salazar, and Kevin Jarbo. To start, I'd like to ask each of our panelists just to offer a few words about themselves as an introduction. Um, Adriana, we'll start with you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Adriana. I am currently a senior now um, at Carnegie Mellon, um, studying electrical and computer engineering. And just a little bit of a background about me is that I am a first gen um, student and I am from a Mexican descent. Great, thanks. Charlie? Hi, um, my name is Charlie. I'm a senior in mechanical engineering and engineering and public policy. Um, at CMU, I've been involved in like research and STEM outreach um, on exec boards for Pi Tau Sigma and Tau Beta Pi Honor Society, um, captain of the women's Frisbee team, president of Women in Mechi, and um, recently founded our um, CMU's chapter of OSTEM. Awesome. I don't know how you have time to do all that, but thank you. All right, Natalie. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie Salazar. I am a sophomore in the Tucker School of Business. I am studying business analytics and technology. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm from Houston, Texas. I am from Mexican descent. I'm also a first generation student. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks, Natalie. James. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James. I'm a senior uh, and first year master's student uh, studying international relations and politics. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a triplet. Um, I'm half uh, African American and half Puerto Rican. And I'm also the uh, co president of the Black Latino Business Association. Perfect. And Kevin. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you're at. Uh, my name is Kevin Jarbo. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Social and Decision Sciences, and I'm an incoming faculty member in that department as well, starting in the fall 2021. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, I also work in the school Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, where my work focuses on uh, developing programming related to the intersections of race and gender identity, and particularly, uh, particularly masculine gender identity development. Um, and like many of the students sharing their first generation status, I'm also a first generation PhD uh, and a first generation American. My father's from Liberia, my mother's from the Philippines. Uh, so yeah, good to be here today. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us. And let's go ahead and jump right in with our first question. So what are some of the best experiences that you all have had with recruiters and why do they stand out as being positive? Charlie, do you wanna take this first one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I had a really good experience with recruiters 
um, last year, last fall, um, and specifically like after um, the career fair, there was an event with recruiters through ASME where um, they were just, instead of like really advertising their company and um, having people just talk about themselves, it was just like open, honest conversations about um, people's interests. Um, we talked about like Pittsburgh and um, Detroit and like just whatever people were interested in. Um, and then they hosted a, an event um, like a week later that they invited um, some people who had applied um, to the company for internships. Um, and I think the biggest thing was that they, instead of just inviting these students, they also let people bring a plus one. Um, so a lot of people brought friends. And so it wasn't just this awkward, like everyone's vying for a job. It was just a lot more casual um, and people were just having like nice conversations. Right. So it felt like they provided an environment where they could get to know you on a personal level. Does anybody have any anything else to add? If not, I'm going to go ahead and ask the flip side of that question, which is without naming any specific company or recruiter names, um, have you had any negative interactions in the recruiting process? And if so, can you talk a little bit about what made them um, less than ideal? Adriana? Yes, uh, I have a couple of stories that come in mind. I think in particular, um, when I've been into any like career fair or really packed event with a lot of people, it's stressful for students. And I also see how it's stressful for recruiters. And I often feel like um, there's not enough of that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction that Charlie was just talking about. So it can often feel like you're just one other application and I think this particularly became um, more difficult when everything became remote and all of the career fairs started to be online and some like some platforms um, didn't work as well as others so we we're um, even forced to essentially communicate with um, recruiters in a text manner. So only uh, responding to them through text. And I think that loses a lot of the one-on-one -on -one interaction and a lot of the value that came from um, just regular career fairs. So those are some of like the negative um, interactions that I've had just not being able to facilitate or to like form any sort of um, bond or conversation just to learn about the company or just learn about the job in general. We kind of felt like that was lost through the process. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, speaking a little bit more towards the, I guess, like the application side of uh, recruiting, um, you know, as an applicant for either internships or for full time positions, um, it can be really frustrating uh, to not hear back from an organization, um, especially when you know you put so much time and effort into doing a cover letter or resume, maybe you get an interview. Um, or something, but then, you know, you get to the end of the road where, you know, you were unsuccessful um, and eventually you either find out you were unsuccessful because it's just been X amount of days or weeks and you just don't hear anything. Um, or maybe you just get an email saying, thank you for applying, um, better luck next time. Uh, and that can be, you know, while at least you received a courtesy email, um, you know, it would have, it, it, it will be, it would be nice um, and helpful as an applicant to understand where you could have done better. Um, throughout the process, whether it have would it have been in the interview or um, on you know what in your resume maybe didn't stand out as much, something that could is like, that can be given to you as an indicator as to where you can improve. Um, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of applicants would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like practices that are maybe a bit dehumanizing or make you feel like more like a number than a person um, are the ones that that really aren't positive. Um, and I know that's hard to do in, in COVID times, but since the, everything is virtual, maybe it's even more important to make those one-on-one -on -one connections with students. Um, what programs and events did you all like um, this year or over the last couple years? And what would you like to see more of that maybe you aren't seeing uh, enough of right now? Charlie, did you? want to take that one? Um, sure. Um, so I think 
Um, one of the things that's really nice is when um, companies have events specifically through um, orgs on campus. So there are a lot of professional orgs that cater to um, different diverse populations on campus. And so having events like through OSTEM or through Women in Mechie, um, like those sorts of events um, will help to bring in a lot of those students. Um, and similarly, like engaging in like things off campus, like um, I went to the Out for Undergrad conference last year for engineering and seeing recruiters there was um, really awesome. Cause just like knowing that those companies support people in the LGBTQ community uh, made it seem like it would be a more welcoming environment to work for. Uh, echoing what Charlie uh, just said, I think that's really important for organizations to reach out to uh, on-campus clubs um, in an effort or an attempt to kind of broaden, uh, I guess you could say like the applicant pool um, I know for me, for myself, as the co-president of the Black Latino Business Association, and last year I was the professional development chair, I spent a lot of time um, going through emails and, and working with different organizations to uh, set up events um, for our members. And it really just helps um, to know that organizations are making an effort, um, a, conscious and, and, um, a conscious effort to reach out to these diverse groups, because uh, it makes us feel welcomed. Um, you know, I think I, like there's a lot of things that go into um, you know deciding what company you might want to work for or uh, you know where you might want to intern and, and so on um, but to know that like some organizations more than others are willing to just branch out and reach out to these certain groups um, rather than just put their name up at a, um, a job fair really does go that much further because um, it shows that these these organizations are interested in bringing in people from diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, and um, moving on to a slightly different topic. Um, the idea of what constitutes professionalism in the workplace has been quickly evolving with the rise in remote work and with it, the emergence of things like more casual dress, um, you know, children and pets in the background um, and just the general sense that it's no longer necessary to conform to an office culture. Um, so Natalie, I'm curious, um, you know, what does the word professionalism mean to you now? And how can companies show that they embrace diverse identities that may not conform to a uniform definition of professionalism? Yeah, so I think especially with these virtual times, uh, professional has definitely shifted significantly and molded into um, a deeper and more significant meaning. Um, I think as I'm applying to internships and as I've been attending more virtual events, professionalism has transcended to essentially authenticity and allowing um, others to see who I truly am on camera with my pets in, in the back, with my family in the back. Um, it's a lot easier to show who you truly are. And in a sense, you can't really hide um, the environments where you grow up and um, so with that, I think it's really important for um, recruiters and um, even attendees to understand that there is no shame in showing your authentic self. Um, I think especially now it's really important um, to be transparent and to just bring yourself as you are. And um, hopefully others understand that we need to be a little bit more flexible during these times um, and really just accept people as they go. So. Uh, yeah, that's mine. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree completely um, uh, about the importance of authenticity and, and acceptance. Um, anyone else, Kevin, or anyone else have any other thoughts on, on this, the subject of being authentic and, and how to bring that to the workplace? I think just as far as the, the professionalism question, like authenticity is important. Um, but I think it's also important as um, a company to make it clear what your expectations are. Um, because I think sometimes like when you see a deficit in like your quote unquote professionalism from students, it's generally because they don't know what the expectations are. That's a great point. Uh, yeah, I could add a little bit more there just in general from the student affairs perspective. 
a big thing that we try to do when we're working with students is really foster that sense of identity, them becoming their whole selves, whether uh, they're defining their, their race or their gender identity or sexuality. And all of these things really factor into how they show up in different spaces across campus, but as how they're gonna show up in the professional world. And so if you're looking to recruit somebody to come and work for your company or whatever it is, and they're 21, 22 years old, or maybe they're coming out of grad school and they're coming up and coming up on their thirties, just kind of like really figuring out who they are and figuring out how they can show up in certain places, it's gonna be really important that they end up in an inclusive environment that actually appreciates the differences that uh, they might be contributing uh, beyond just you know being a, a number uh, as some folks have expressed that they feel reduced to, but like there is a person behind every single statistic that you acquire, every data point that you acquire, there's a person behind that and they're trying to bring their whole selves into a space. And I think that companies that, you know, the word here authentic, who are able to authentically show that they care about that sort of representation being in their organization is like really important for people to be able to see, make them feel welcome and, you know, really enhance how, how well they fit in and how productive they can be in the place as well. Uh, because it kind of takes that pressure off of figuring out what the definition of professionalism means in a certain place and allows them to kind of be themselves and just get their work done. Thanks, Kevin, that was really well said. And, and this next question is one that we got from a few different employers. Um, but the question is what matters most to you when you're considering an offer of employment? Um, and how would you assess whether the opportunity, the company is the right fit for you? Um, and Adriana, since you are a senior and you just went through this process of evaluating offers and accepting one, um, I'll let you take this question first. Yes. Uh, so as Kristen just mentioned, I went through the whole recruiting process um, last semester to find a full-time job. <laughs> and one of the most important aspects um, I felt that um, really started separating companies when I was searching um, where to look is more on their whole, like, what they actually do when you ask them the question of like, how is your um, diversity and inclusion like policies working in your current company? I think that often um, time separated companies who were just reading their blurb that they have on their website, like, oh, we have like this group, this group, that group, um, and we're working on many more, which is always like a great start. And I think that's awesome. But I think there are always um, other companies who had either recruiters or people in their work, in their um, workforce who knew ex the exact um, policies or change that they were implementing by either donating to, um, important causes or just um, really making sure that um, people of color, women are getting promoted to um, higher, higher positions because you can put a nice statement on your website, but if that doesn't really reflect like your leadership board or your workforce that kind of gave me like the wrong idea. So I think for me, that was the number one um, aspect that I was looking at is what are companies doing to actually promote these diversity and inclusive um, policies and are they actually going through and fulfilling them um, mm -hmm. so I think that was the most important aspect when looking for a, a full-time job or an internship um, nowadays so making sure the companies are walking the walk <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah and that kind of leads into my next question which is um, where do you find this information so if you want to you know discover things like um, whether there are non-gendered restroom facilities available or the number of employees from minority backgrounds who are in leadership positions or whether gender identity is even included in a company's non-discrimination policy. Where do you go to look for this information and, and is it easy to find or do you wish that it were more readily available? I can jump in uh, here a little bit. Um, I would say for me, it's typically going on a company's website um, and, and looking through uh, who are who is in positions of power or um, executive positions, uh, leadership positions, and seeing you know the uh, the makeup of, of those people, um, their backgrounds, where they're from, um, seeing who you know whether or not it's diverse. 
Um, and I think another thing that I also do from time to time is if, if I have the opportunity or the ability to, is to reach out to people who, who I might know um, who may be working um, at a place where I'm uh, looking at. So uh, reaching out to them, getting a feel for, um, you know, hearing their perspective of how they um, interpret the workplace. Um, you know, you might find that they might be the only person of color there or the only person of a diverse background, or, you know, maybe a company is actually fulfilling their diversity promises. Um, and, and it is a, a very diverse and um, equitable and uh, inclusive back or, uh, organization. And then that can really help to, um, you know, either solidify your interests um, and make you feel really, really good, or in, uh, on the other side of things, maybe not so much about an organization. Great. And what about during the interview process? So how comfortable do you feel asking questions during an interview to assess cultural fit? Um, and is there anything that might make it easier for you to do this? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, so like personally, I've never been uncomfortable um, with asking those questions, um, but I've found that a lot of time recruiters aren't always super comfortable answering them. Um, so like I've, I've found just by asking those questions that a lot of times um, what you're seeing from recruiters are like the most diverse backgrounds that you'll see like from anyone at the company. Like um, I was talking to a female recruiter one time and asked her like how many women were in the workplace. And she was like, I'm one of two out of like a hundred. Um, and so I think like there's there's kind of this idea of like you wanna, <laughs> the, the companies want to seem diverse. So they send recruiters who like have, you know, more diverse backgrounds um, and then a lot of times, like I, I've talked to recruiters who just like were kind of like wishy-washy in their answers and then going to the websites, like finding out that there isn't much diversity at the company. Um, so I think just like, <laughs> it, I haven't had any problem asking the questions, but I think recruiters should be comfortable answering those questions. Mm -hmm. I agree. So maybe some training or, or Maybe it's the content of the answers that are making people uncomfortable, um, but either way, it sounds like that's something that could be worked on. Um, if a company wanted to impress you all with their diverse and inclusive environment, how, how could they do that though in a way that feels really authentic? And are there any, um, any sort of stigmas associated with DEI recruiting initiatives? Natalie, you want to take that one? I was about to jump in. Okay. Um, so um, definitely, I think I've had many inauthentic experiences where I've sat looking for internships, um, staring at slides, having um, recruiters read off them, uh, kind of the whole mission statement spiel about how they have diversity and inclusion. But you know, following up with Charlie, what she said, um, are they actually, you know, comfortable um, answering those? questions and um, do they have the information? I think um, oftentimes conversations are more authentic and when you take those slides away and you actually have those um, conversations and they feel authentic and people are uncomfortable about telling the truth and um, that really, at least for me, shows that a company cares and that they actually have diversity and inclusion and that they're willing to answer these questions and show up. So I think um, definitely those authentic conversations leave a very um, impression, a very good impression um, and mean a lot, especially to minority students. I'll quickly jump into the stigmas part of the question. Um, I don't wanna say that there is a stigma around diversity and inclusion, um, but I do feel that it's like one of those buzzwords that um, has to be on every like website or portfolio and whatnot. Um, but one thing that I personally uh, sometimes feel awkward in is when they are, there is a conversation around diversity and, oops, sorry, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> my niece is in the background, when there is um, some sort of um, topic about diversity in a room and you're the only like, person of color or you're the only woman and you feel like there's like staring right at you. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, that's 
that's just something that's um, happened um, at either recruiting events or just like school events in general. So I think having um, people who are talking about that subject being diverse themselves and maybe speaking about their own experiences on like the workplace um, really helps you feel less alone and less isolated mm -hmm. when they're just talking about these statistics and these numbers, but they're not really um, a part of it. I think that really makes me feel isolated and just feels like the pressure's on me. <laughs> yeah. Would you all rather um, a, a company be truthful, like even if it means that they haven't done a lot in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and their numbers aren't great yet, would you rather hear the truth and hear that they're working on it than have a, a company or recruiter just kind of gloss over that? Um, I definitely much rather prefer a company be truthful and straight up um, with any applicant, just because, you know, it's better to know that, you know, that they're honest, one, um, you know, integrity should be, uh, or hopefully is a, a value of, of uh, every organization. Um, but being truthful helps to know, but then also perhaps maybe they're working on um, areas in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if they can say, you know, right now things aren't great, but we are working and and then working on it and, you know, maybe showing how there maybe there's tangibles or ideas in the work that they are um, preparing or, or working on. If you can show that to an applicant, I think that also goes a long way. All right, so we are going to turn to the Q&A um, in a few minutes, and I want to encourage you all to put questions in the Q&A because we did save, um, you know, a lot of time in the webinar to get to the questions that you might have. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to um, turn to Kevin again and just ask if you might be able to provide a brief overview of the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion and also maybe talk a little bit about the best um, way for recruiters to approach or to partner with the CSDI. Yeah, uh, for sure thing. Uh, so the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion uh, as an actual physical space and, and as a unit on campus has been around going, we're going into our fourth academic year. Uh, I started working there myself as a grad student. I've been working there for the past three years as a postdoctoral fellow as well. A uh, big part of our mission at the center is to provide identity-based support for all of our students on campus from both the student affairs perspective as well as the academic perspective. So here on campus, the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion is situated between half and half, basically in our division of student affairs, as well as in our academic side, like our provost side of the university as well. So uh, we kind of have these touch points across the entire university in terms of what student life is like from, uh, you know, engaging with different sorts of programs on campus, supporting our student organizations, as well as running academic support service programs and putting students in touch with those as well. So a lot of our staff members work to advise different student organizations uh, across the board, uh, and especially our student organizations that are affiliated with different sorts of like professional fields. So uh, as some, some things have been mentioned already. So like one, a couple of our bigger groups that have these focus foci on uh, serving like underrepresented racial groups uh, for instance, are the National Society for Black, Black Engineers or NSBE. Uh, we also, uh, so there's undergrad and graduate chapters of that. Uh, James had mentioned the Black and Latino Business Association or BLBA. But we also have a number of other organizations like our First Together group, uh, which is comprised of a lot of uh, first generation college students uh, across the board. Uh, and there tends to be like a high representation of students from underrepresented racial backgrounds, as well as a variety of uh, broad representation of people with different gender identities as well. And so we try to provide this kind of holistic support for students. As I mentioned earlier, that is about developing their identity as people, as human beings here on campus and how they'll be integrated within society. Uh, and we try to do that from both like the living and learning perspectives. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, and I guess the best way to get in touch with us, and I can drop this email in the chat, uh, is to email us at CSDI, and that's the initialism for the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, so CSDI at andrew.cmu.edu, and that'll put you in touch with folks, and we'll be able to like triage your messages to where they need to go, and that's a great way to coordinate with us about ways we could potentially partner with you all in recruiting and connecting you with student organizations. 
Perfect. All right, so we do have a lot of great questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to turn to those now. Um, and panelists, feel free to jump in um, whenever something uh, speaks to you. Um, but our first question is, how comfortable are students with organizations who are beginning their DEI work versus organizations who are more established in that area of their business? Um, I can jump in here. Um, as uh, a co-president for the Black Latino Business Association, um, I think, you know, for us, we don't necessarily know all the time um, how a, a company's DEI practices, because more often than not, they're just kind of popping up with an email in our inbox. Um, and we're more than happy to then go ahead and, and begin that relationship um, with an organization. I think for us, it's important, like I mentioned earlier, that an organization show interest in uh, people from diverse backgrounds. And simply by just reaching out um, through our email or through uh, CPDC or through the Tepper School of Business and then them relaying to us um, that an organization is interested in, in partnering with us, I think that goes a long way uh, just to show that they are interested. Um, and, and then on, you know, if a company isn't necessarily um, well versed in working in the DEI space, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't get better. Um, and, and it just helps to, you know, if we have, you know, a workshop or a Q and A uh, event with an organization, um, and and it and it goes well, or if it doesn't go well, you know, you can find ways to improve. Or if it goes well, then you go, you ha you know, you have a second one later on, and you bring in more students, and then that relationship just continues to evolve uh, between our organization or any other organization um, and a company. Um, and so I think you know, it it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, maybe to uh, to some organizations on campus it might, but. I would say for a fair few number, it, it, it probably doesn't just because I think just that initiative of a company reaching out to a student organization is really important. Mm -hmm. So maybe it matters more what you're doing now than what you've done in the past and showing genuine interest um, in DEI initiatives. Great. Um, all right, next question. Um, what would be your ideal recruiting experience that would lead you to making a decision that makes you feel good? jump on this one um there are some of the some of the positives that i have felt through the recruiting process is when there's um one consistent point of contact throughout the entire recruiting experience um there's often times where uh, you get like uh, a whole bunch of different people um who email you um and then you kind of not, you're not too sure like what person or who exactly um you should be asking your questions to or um, what you'll be expecting as you progress through the um, recruiting process. So when there's like one point of contact, like either that's one recruiter who's been with you from the start um, to the end, I think that's been a really positive because you start to get to know them and you feel more comfortable asking them um, those hard questions that you wouldn't often feel um, not as comfortable asking the, somebody that you just met. So that's always been a really positive experience of mine is when um, the person who I was in contact from the start is the same person who is giving me my offer or something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody else want to jump in? Okay, our next question is about professional growth or development. Um, how important is it to um, hear of professional growth or development opportunities? Um, and what specifically would you be looking for a company to provide you with? Um, I can, oh, Natalie, do you want to take this? You got I'll be, it. Yeah, re real quick. Uh, I think it's very important um, because it shows that there's opportunity for growth and you could potentially put yourself um, as a perspective in leadership position or maybe have opportunities um, to kind of step out of your comfort zone. And I think especially um, in a professional setting, having resources like financial wellness, at least for me as a first generation, like learning about these things is very important and understanding like what benefits, uh, maybe what options I have to um, develop myself professionally, like those are really important. So that's definitely something that I look for and I'm sure others do as well. Yeah, just to add to that, um, I think providing opportunities for networking are super important for students just because a lot of times, especially like 
first generation students might not know a lot of people who are higher up in their field. And so just something as simple as like providing opportunities for networking with people within the company can um, be really helpful. Anybody else want to add? Okay. Um, I think this is a good question. Um, it's about red flags that you may have noticed. So um, when a company brings up diversity, equity, and inclusion during the recruiting process, um, are there any red flags that come up for you? Or is there or maybe any, any words that feel particularly inauthentic? Um, anybody have any thoughts on that? Um, I guess uh, I'm kind of just speaking from not from a place of experience, but one that might be might uh, happen to somebody or might have happened to somebody um, where, you know, you might be at an event um, like a, a job fair or something and you hear a recruiter speak uh, about diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and, and then you, you know, maybe you're interested in the, in the company and then you go to, you know, read up more about their practices and then, you know, you can't find anything or you find maybe a blurb or two um, about maybe something that they're doing, but there really isn't anything um, like sufficient or of substance there that you can find. Um, and then you're just kind of left pondering um, whether or not, you know, what they were saying was authentic or true, or is, you know, if the company really invests time um, and effort into their practices of DEI. Um, I think that could be, you know, something that might be that might have happened or could be possible. Um, another thing is just, you know, if you are speaking with a recruiter um, and they just kind of maybe mention DEI, but they don't really um, speak about it in depth. Uh, Charlie mentioned, you know, at, at interviews asking a question on DEI and the company, you know, maybe giving a bog standard answer and not being able to elaborate that, that I think, you know, for for a lot of people, that would be a red flag because, you know, if, I think, you know, it, it, it's not something easy to necessarily do if you're at an interview and ask about um, DEI practices, it could be kind of intimidating. Um, and so, you know, if you do ask that question, you are hoping for, a, you know, a, substance, a sub, substantive answer um, or response back. So it can be uh, kind of disheartening to not receive that. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Frick. I also work in the Career and Professional Development Center. I'm helping Kristen manage some of the great questions that we have. So Kristen, and I wanted to pop in with one that we saw towards the bottom of the list. So for internships to date, what did or didn't make you feel supported in the company? Any volunteers, James? Uh, yeah, I guess I can jump in here. Um, I think just, you know, um, for anyone, if you're doing an internship, um, just having people on your team or within the company, just um, having that uh, or being willing to reach out to you at any time, being open, receptive. Um, you know, the, one of the, I had a, an internship this past summer and um, pretty much everyone I spoke with was really open um, to just saying, hey, you know, if you need anything, just shoot me a message at any time, uh, like any point of the day, if you need anything, just shoot me a message. If I can't get back to you straight away, I'll get back to you at some point. Um, and so it was really refreshing just knowing that people who I had never met um, before, like on my very first day, were just so open to helping me um, in any manner that they could. So just knowing that that's a possibility really can go a long way for people as well. Another thing that really helped me was um, having a mentor in my previous internship. I think mentorship goes a long way, and especially having that one person that you can go to um, is very relieving, whereas like reaching out to a big group or maybe um, expecting to hear back is a little bit more intimidating. Having a mentor establishes that relationship where you feel comfortable reaching out if anything were to come up. Um, and another thing also, um, support groups, like other mentors, um, even people that are your age that are able to share some similar experiences, like that's definitely helped me a lot, having students there, so. Thanks, Natalie. We also got a question about how important mentorship is to you. So I think that was really helpful with that as well. 
Another one I saw that I was um, curious about is um, what are some of the biggest barriers that might prevent students of color, students with disabilities um, from applying for internships? I would say one of the biggest barriers is not being sure if you're the right fit for that role. Like maybe you see a quick posting on Handshake or on LinkedIn uh, about a job opening, um, but then you read through the description or you read or you learn a little bit more about the company and then you say, oh, I don't really think that's for me or I don't see myself in that specific area or space. Um, that's probably one of the biggest barriers So you psych yourself out or get imposter syndrome by thinking that you're probably not going to get it. Um, I think for, for me specifically, I often stopped myself from applying because I didn't believe in myself or I thought, oh, their requirements are too excessive. I'm not um, capable of handling this role. Um, but then later finding out that uh, all of those requirements weren't uh, weren't exactly necessary. They were just kind of there to talk more about the role. Um, but being a woman and me being a person of color, I, in my mind, I was like, oh, I need to fill and I need to be good at everything in order to apply <laughs> or else mm -hmm. I'm going to fail. So I think a lot of that um, is or six, what prevented me from either applying or putting myself more out there when it came to searching for for jobs. Mm -hmm. right. Aside from qualifications, is there anything else that you felt kind of um, made you hesitate before applying or, or made you feel like you wouldn't be able to complete an internship or get an internship? Yeah, I can speak a little bit about this. So I think uh, as a sophomore, definitely um, one of the barriers I've encountered frequently has been um, experience and just having confidence in being the first to do it. Oftentimes, like my um, colleagues, peers have parents or mentors that have been through similar experiences and they have advice to give. And kind of, I've felt like I've had to figure things out by trial and error. So showing up to recruiting events and um, not having a correct resume or maybe um, just doing things that may not be considered professional, but then learning from those experiences. And I think definitely that's been a barrier, uh, but it's def definitely made me understand the importance of putting yourself out there and showing up. So I think, um, yeah. Um, I just want to add something here too, to build off of what uh, Adriana and Natalie said, especially taking this from a more like systemic equity sort of perspective. Right. So the question being about students of color or students with disabilities, right? Those people are going to have some unique needs that because of the way that things tend to work out in our society as it is, some you know, students of color, for instance, might be disproportionately affected by being from a lower income background, for instance. So uh, if your internship doesn't pay very well, or if it's an unpaid internship, then you're not going to get students applying for that. And that ends up being one of these things where like only students from higher income backgrounds are able to afford to do. Uh, for students with disabilities, if your organization doesn't have support for people with either physical or cognitive disabilities or neurodivergence, then uh, you know, why would that student look to be in that particular place, not knowing whether or not they would get that support? So, you know, while you have on this one side, students are kind of like not necessarily feeling confident or like they might belong or they might fit or they might not do well in a particular position because of their own skills. But there's also like these other aspects of their background that there are some major social factors that influence how successful they can be in certain places. And it's not necessary that certain people need more resources, but they need the right resources for them to be able to thrive in a specific place and make them feel like they have a chance at it. So if those are things that you can build in, then that would probably increase the likelihood that students from different backgrounds will apply to those positions. Yeah, thank you for that, Kevin. I think that's a really important point. And it's often something that's really hard for students to ask for. Um, so I think it's important that employers take the initiative in thinking about some of those barriers. Um, uh, this is a, a, a slightly, I think, easier question, um, but is there a specific type of event that you find to be the best use of your time or that you would be most interested in attending? So, for example, would you prefer to find out 
more about a company during an hour long presentation or would you rather spend that time doing something like mock interviews, um, resume feedback or um, technical interview prep help? So, you know, just a general presentation versus like, I guess, um, more constructive developmental help. And we may have different opinions on this one, but. Yeah, I went to an event, I believe it was during the summer, so it was virtual. Um, and so the jobs I'm applying to are more on the technical aspect on things. So this event for this company was a um, technical interview prep sort of thing, uh, but we were put into groups. So you had groups of like five, um, five students all from different um, colleges and universities and one engineer. And we essentially went through um, what the first round interview would be like. And we even um, were posed one of the technical questions, but we solved it as a group. Um, so there was no, um, there was no pressure on being like the smartest person or saying um, the stupid thing um, because we were all trying to solve the question as a group. And I thought that um, said a lot about the company and we got to learn a lot about the one engineer who we were put in into. And then after that, we broke up into like the bigger group and we just discussed our question and we were able to not only learn about the company, but also get some technical interview prep in, which was really nice and I, and I appreciate it. So I thought that was pretty unique and I don't think I've um, been invited or seen other companies do something similar. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we have a good question. Um, from someone who works at a smaller company. And that is, how can a small company, a startup or a small nonprofit compete if they don't have a recruiter on staff or if they don't have a lot of resources um, to devote to DEI just yet? I know something that we do here as professionals at Carnegie Mellon is that we look to other units for the kinds of professional skills that they have. And internally in the company, like this might look something like, you know, uh, maybe blocking out one to two hours a week where current employees like dedicate some of their effort towards doing some DEI initiatives. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be like, you know, start from the ground up, like becoming a professional anti-racist or something like that. But they can do something like how Natalie mentioned, having like a mentorship program, having somebody say like, look, for one to two hours a week, we need you to talk to some of our like new interns right, in order to kind of guide them through how the company works. That's a way that you kind of like get some people to continue to keep doing like their, their basic job, but be training new people up and kind of like welcoming and including someone into an environment to kind of show them the ropes. And so like, I think that's like one simple thing where you can leverage the people who you already have uh, to just like help bring in and foster new folks into the environment until you build the capacity to do like larger scale recruitment efforts. But if you already establish that as a culture for your company, then you don't need a DEI recruiter in the long run because it's just already a part of the way that you operate. So if you think about the ways that you can basically answer the question of, how is our company setting ourselves up to make sure that anyone who applies here can thrive here, then you won't necessarily need a DEI professional to come in and do that sort of work on your behalf because it will just be the way that you do things. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. And as someone who worked for a very small company before, I can tell you that I think it all goes back to that authentic connection that we were talking about at the beginning. And you can have anyone um, reach out and have authentic connections with students. And sometimes if that person reaching out happens to be the CEO or the head of engineering, um, it's, you know, it makes the student feel even better to know that they are, you know, worth that person's time. So I think even for small companies, just focusing on that connection and that authenticity. All right, so I'm going to combine a couple questions because I know we're running out of time. But one question is, what DEI programs do you look for in a workplace? And another question is, when a company prevent, presents you with an offer to join them, either for an internship or a full-time job, what company highlights or details are important for the hiring manager to talk about when making the offer? So aside from hearing about salary and benefits, what other things do you want to hear about? And maybe that is what DEI programs um, happen to be in the workplace. Uh, 
Um, I guess just as like, um, for, for an internship experience, one of the important things for me was figuring out like, if I'm going to some other city, where am I going to be living? Um, how is the company gonna help me figure that out if I don't know anyone there um, and don't know anyone at the company and that sort of thing. Um, and so like the companies I was applying to, like they always like said like, here's our housing policy or we'll help you find some place like close by. Um, like, so transportation and housing um, were big for me for internships, just since I wasn't sure how I was going to get anywhere or um, any of that. Thanks. Um, Dan, any other sorry, go ahead. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, in terms of like any potential DEI programs, uh, I know we've talked a bit about, you know, mentor programs, um, you know, you can find a way to do uh, DEI mentor programs um, either within, you know, specific teams and then kind of do a rotational program within teams um, or expand it to the entire business and see, you know, just kind of match up um, a mentee with a mentor from a different part of the business and just that also knocks out uh, kind of your networking um, aspect of, of, uh, of work as well. Um, affinity groups or um, like resource groups are another big thing for people um, knowing that, you know, maybe there's um, DEI groups uh, for different ethnicities or different, um, uh, just different groups of people within the workplace so that way they can kind of get together um, and share that, that commonality that they have um, instead of just maybe just being clumped together with everybody um, can definitely help as well. Thanks, James. I have a follow-up question. So we talked a lot about connections and authenticity, and I think maybe one of the challenges that we're all going through right now is how to connect in this virtual environment. So one of our participants asked maybe some best practices for trying to build relationships and connect virtually, if our panelists have any advice. I'd say that one-on-one um, -on -one conversations mean a lot more than being bunched into a group where sometimes your voice isn't heard. Um, they also leave for great mentorship and for authentic, um, meaningful relationships where a student may feel comfortable in the future following up or maybe um, having another conversation later on. But I think uh, conversations are very important, especially if they're one-to-one -one, where meaningful relationships may be established. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and just to add on to that, I think, um, you know, phone calls are great um, and all, but I think in this day and age with the technology that we do have, um, doing something like this, but in a one-on-one -on -one environment, doing a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams or what, whatever, um, doing that I think is really great um, because it breaks down that barrier of not being able to see someone's face. Um, and although while you can't be um, seeing each other in person, you can at least see each other um, over, uh, you know, through your computer. And that also goes to help to, uh, to start to build that relationship um, where people, you know, might feel more comfortable reaching out or following up after a meeting. Yeah, another add on to that um, is I'm a member of SWE, which is Society of Women Engineers. Um, and I know they do these like virtual um, coffee chats. So if you think that it might be really hard to have like one um, engineer, one um, one worker talk to like one student, then um, if you do like sort of like a speed dating type of thing where you have virtual coffee chats, it's like um, you constantly are meeting new people and that way still able to have like the one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation. Um, that's a nice way to um, host that type of event and uh, being able to um, interact with multiple students. Um, while keeping it on the on the short side of things. All right, thanks guys. Those are all really good good ideas. And we're wrap, we're getting towards the end of our time. I do want to ask one more question, maybe for like a, a minute or two, um, because it's been asked a few times in the chat. And that is what kinds of specific things in a company culture do you look for to help you to be your authentic self? No, it's, it's a hard, it is a hard question. Um, I guess like it's 
a little more challenging, like in the online um, era that we're kind of doing things right now. But in general, like, you know, going into the workplace and seeing people have like pictures on their desks or even like easy things like that, or um, people talking about what they do on the weekends or in the evenings, like, you know, talking about their interests outside of work um, and just kind of being open about um, like their real life outside of just being an employee. Um, and oh, sorry, Natalie, do you wanna do you wanna go real quick? Real quick, uh, I would just say, seeing people like myself um, helps me visualize myself in that work environment. So meeting people from similar backgrounds, experiences, etc. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Um, and so I, I would actually add on to that, you know, seeing people who look like me um, or who might emulate certain lifestyles or my lifestyle or, or background um, definitely goes a long way. But also for the people who may who may not look like me or may not share my experiences, being able to have, uh, you know, authentic, real conversations with those people and then them in return, you know, reciprocating the same sort of, um, I guess you say, like tone um, or, or whatnot with that conversation, um, you know, establishing a friendship among the people that you work with um, or the people that you see on a daily basis within your, your workplace can go a long way. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily create kind of like that fake friendship or that kind of like um, that just purely work environment friendship where, you know, where you might want to be able to, you know, um, have a coffee on the weekends or something like that, or, you know, um, talk about sports after work or something like that, you know, have a phone call with your, with your buddy from work um, outside of work hours, doing things like that, where you can be real and authentic with people um, who may not look like you, but you do see on a daily basis can really help to enhance, you know, the feeling that you get while you're at work, but also with others, because then you have that camaraderie amongst each other. Um, and then, you know, if anything were to come up in the workplace, you can handle it. Um, as friends rather than kind of as strangers, even though you've been working together for however long. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I, I know I speak for everybody when I say that it has been so inspiring to hear all of our panelists speak confidently about the importance of being able to bring their authentic selves into the workplace. And so I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to share these insights with us. Um, I also want to thank all of our employer partners for showing up today and for really taking the time to listen. Um, I know we didn't get to quite all of the questions, but I hope that you've gained some insights that will help you enhance your recruiting strategies at CMU and beyond. Um, and the CPDC looks forward to working with all of you. Um, we wish you continued productivity, growth, success, and well-being in 2021. So thank you all for coming today. <laughs>